today, um, and a special um, morning to all of you fathers out there. We're so glad you joined us today. Why don't you stand up and we'll worship together. Oh, we look to the sun. Begin to open, and the 
blindness meets the light. If you have so say, I see the world in light. I see the world in wonder. I see the world in light, bursting in living color. I see the world your way. Never seen the wonder in the air of second life, having come out of the water with the old one left behind. If you have so say, I see the world in light. Well, I see the world. grateful who is grateful for uh for jesus being your father amen yeah yeah tell you what i'm grateful for earthly fathers but uh i am more even even so that uh that jesus is the lord and that he teaches me how to be a father he teaches me how to be a son that he leads me in that we're not alone i cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree with his body bound and drenched in tears 
They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Transfixed on Jesus' face. Yeah, what a sweet day that will be. We get to rest with our Father in heaven in that perfect place that He's prepared for us. Jesus, say it out, Jesus. Amen. 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 God, we thank you today. We thank you that you are the ultimate father, that you are the ultimate gentleman, that you are the ultimate leader, Lord. God, we thank you that you are strong on the cross. We were strong on the throne, Lord, so that we could have a life with you. God, we love you. We lift your name today. Amen. Amen.
follows Jesus. I love that. He teaches me about Jesus. And I just love him. He lets me play with my sister. Play. You like to play with your dad? I love you, dad. Oh, yes. Well, happy Father's Day, all you dads out there. We're glad that you're here with us to celebrate the goodness of God together as we celebrate our dad every Sunday, of course. Our Heavenly Father and all you dads that are working hard and sharing your faith with your kids, it's so imperative. We're super excited to have Rick Green with us here today, this weekend, um, on Father's Day as we talk about the founding fathers and in our series on power and uh, what it was, the power of God, what it really was to, to make this country happen and, and to make it continue to happen and how important it is for us to, to hold on to those values and Christian values and live them out. And so, Rick, we were just talking. Uh, we were trying to remember when he was here last. It was, I think it was 2012. He's been here twice. We were both a lot younger. Well, yeah, we were younger and less gray, I think. And, yeah. and now he has a grandbaby coming, and so that's exciting. But uh, anyway, so we're super excited to have him back. We'd love to have him come whenever we can, especially when something's going on up here. And, and so welcome so much again. Would you guys all welcome Rick Green up here? As he's coming, let me just say a couple things. Rick Green, he's a former state, uh, Texas, uh, the Texas state representative. He's a national speaker, author, radio host. He travels with David Barton. We've talked about that over the last several weeks about our America's forgotten history and the emphasis of moral, religious, and constitutional heritage. Uh, he's a co-host with the national radio program, Wall Builders Live. He is also the executive producer and author of Constitution Live, America's most engaging and entertaining study of the U.S. Constitution, and it is really good. A bunch of materials out here that I encourage you to pick up. He and his wife and uh, Kara have four kids, as I said, and one of them is going to have a baby here soon. Uh, they do a... They have a new venture called Chasing American Legends, a new TV show that follows uh, their family. It's kind of like a, like a uh, reality it show. Like it's really reality fun. Um, kind of reminds me of Duck Dynasty a little bit there. <laughs> a <laughs> patriotic Duck Dynasty. Yes, there you go. Uh, and With then, no beards, <laughs> or at least my little bitty wannabe beard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have some serious They have beards. some real beards. Yeah. So anyway, he's here to challenge us today, so we're super grateful he's here and uh, Appreciate you being Appreciate here. Appreciate it, man. And, yeah, Thank you. Right. Thank okay. you, brother. Let him rip. All right. Good morning. Good to be back with you guys. I, I, I Just for those of you that might not have been here a few years ago, quick reminder what Wall Builders actually is. People ask us if we're in construction. No, that comes out of the scripture in Nehemiah that says, arise and rebuild the walls that we may no longer be a reproach. And so what it's all about is actually rebuilding the foundations. If you think about the Old Testament days, those outer walls determined the strength of your nation. If you didn't have those, you were easily run over. So I'm, I'm blessed to get to work with David Barton. He's got the largest private collection of Founding Fathers documents in the world. So when we talk about what the founders said or did or what the foundation is that America was built upon, we're actually bringing that from the original documentation. And ha had a really interesting time uh, a couple of months ago. We were digging through some of the documents, had no idea this was, this was news to me. So if you're curious about sort of the foundation of America and where we came from, you may think that the Founding Fathers didn't have a lot of the tools that we have uh, today in, in their communication and being able to get together between the 13 colonies. But believe it or not, we discovered in all these archives that we have some interesting transcripts that uh, that now reveal why they were able to outmaneuver the most powerful military on the planet. Let's see if I can get my uh, my first slide up here, guys. I'm going to I'm going to share with you, these are, these are top secret now, most people don't know, this is July 4th is coming up, Independence Day in a couple weeks, so I thought I'd share this with you. We have uh, uh, discovered the, the uh, transcripts of the Twitter communications between the Founding Fathers. So just to get us started this morning, I'm going to share this with you. So the first one's from Tommy J. Hey guys, working on a new draft of the Declaration, which inalienable rights do you want to include? Hashtag independence. John Adams responded, Liberty and a, and a Twitter app that doesn't stink, am I right? Uh, then John Adams, again, by the way, who has pics from the last Continental Congress, want to upload them to Facebook. Hancock jumps in, just emailed them uh, to you. Oh, Penny saved. You still drafting with MS Parchment? New Penny saved, by the way. Y'all get that one? That's Benjamin Franklin. Okay, so new ice girl comes out on Tuesday. Looks sweet. John Adams, Hancock, got it. Thanks. What's up with your email signature? It's like font size 50. 
Get it? You know, have you ever heard the John Hank sign with you because his hand name so big on the declaration? Uh, James Madison, laugh out loud. Tommy J. Seriously, guys, I don't want to pull another all-nighter on this. Need ideas? G. Washington. Ugh, my wig is totally crooked in every pick. Please don't tag me. <laughs> He's like my wife. Okay, British are good. Then Paul Revere, breaking. The British are coming. Tommy J., the British are coming. James Madison, hide your kids, hide your wives. The British are coming. Wait for it. This is my favorite part. King George, uh, you guys know I can see everything you tweet, right? <laughs> Tommy J., settings, tweet privacy, protect my tweets. Okay, so I just uh, had to, okay, so that didn't really exist, didn't really happen. But they did, in fact, found the greatest nation in the history of the world. And they did, in fact, do something different from what anybody else in history had ever done. And so when we think about what happened in the beginning of our nation and how they managed to put together a formula that would produce such incredible results. We've got to think about it in terms of what can we learn from what they did and how can we apply that today. So I want to take us first to Psalm 78. I want to share this. This is a little bit long, so stay with me uh, through this. But I think it really helps us put in context what's happening in America today and what we can do to restore our foundation. Listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I tell you. I'm chewing on the morsel of a proverb. I'll tell you in the sweet old truth, stories we heard from our fathers counsel we learned at our mother's knee, we're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing it along to the next generation. God's fame and fortune, the marvelous things he has done. He planted a witness and Jacob said his word firmly in Israel, then commanded our parents to teach it to their children. So the next generation would know and all the generations to come, that they would know the truth and tell the stories so their children can trust in God, never forgetting the works of God, but keeping his commands to the letter. Heaven forbid they should be like their parents, bullheaded and bad, a fickle and faithless bunch who never stayed true to God. The Ephraimites, armed to the teeth, ran off when the battle began. So they were equipped. They had the weapons, but they ran off when the battle began. They were cowards to God's covenant, refused to walk by his word. They had forgotten what he had done. Marvels he had done right before their eyes. He performed miracles in plain sight of their parents in Egypt, out on the fields of Zoan. He split the sea and they walked right through it. He piled the waters to the right and the left. He led them by day with a cloud, led them all, all the night with a fiery torch. He split rocks in the wilderness, gave them all they could drink from underground springs. He made creeks flow out from sheer rock and water pour out like a river. So you think about all those amazing things that he did. And the psalmist is telling us, don't forget to remind your children of all these great things where God exercises power right before our eyes so that they will know that God is real, that he has exercised those things in our lives and we've seen it happen and that they will follow his commands. We used to do that in America. John Adams used to remind us the general principles upon which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. So he's saying as a nation, we were founded on these Christian principles. If we're going to be successful in the, in the future, we've got to hold on to those principles. Benjamin Franklin had to literally remind the other founding fathers of the things God had done, how he had exercised his power and shown himself to us in the Revolutionary War. Now, Benjamin Franklin is one of the least religious founding fathers. I mean, this is not a Bible-thumping evangelical here. He's not even a Christian, but he recognizes the hand of God. He's not an atheist. He's not an agnostic. He's not a deist. He knows that God is involved in our daily lives. He's seen God work in the American War for Independence. But he's not, he does not believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So I'm not suggesting Franklin was a Christian. In fact, the opposite, but I think that makes the point even stronger because he recognized the importance of the Christian religion and what it does in a culture in a positive way. Here's what he said to the guys at the Constitutional Convention. And, and to put this in context, this is about five weeks into the convention. So if you go back to 1787 and you insert yourself in the convention, at about five weeks in, people are literally leaving the convention. It's falling apart. It's not working. And so Benjamin Franklin gets up and reminds them of what God had done already and how we needed to keep God in our equation. He said, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Now, the reason Ben Franklin can say, in the beginning, we had prayer in this room is because he was there. He's one of only six guys to be at both the signing of the, the, of the Constitution and the signing of the Declaration. And so he tells the other guys in the room at the Constitutional Convention, he says, do you remember what it was like? I mean, we were taking on the greatest military in the world. No way we could win without God on our side. And he reminded them of what God had done for us. He said, our prayers were heard and they were graciously answered. All of us engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And then he asked the very question we need desperately to be asked in 2017. Have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Do we imagine we no longer need 
his assistance. We've been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this and I also believe without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. What's he saying? He's saying we have to remember what God has already done in our nation and not forget that we need him going forward. So see, they had forgotten, right? They had already forgotten. We're only 11 years old as a nation. They had already forgotten the marvels that God had done in our nation. And so here we have the least religious founding father being the one to get up and remind them, let's not forget what God's done here. Let's make sure that we recognize it and then we continue uh, to follow it. So I'll oh, see, I already did that part. So he said, um, he said, I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and his blessing on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. So what he's saying is, hey guys, we can't forget God's role in what we're doing and we cannot do this without him. Now I didn't give you the whole speech that he gave. There's actually a pretty short speech, but in that short speech that he gives, he quotes 14 Bible verses off the top of his head. And people want to say these guys weren't Christians or they weren't people of faith or they didn't follow the Christian religion or implement the Christian religion and what we're doing. One of the least religious is quoting it off the top of his head. And he went on to say, guys, we're not smart enough. We need the father of lights to illuminate our understanding. We need to make sure that we're learning from the one that actually got us here in the first place. John Adams, in the same way, he talked about the hand of God and the founding of the country. He said, it appears to me the eternal son of God is operating powerfully against the British nation. See, Washington talked about how the wind would come in at the right time, how the fog would come in at the right time or go away at the right time. And over and over and over again, God intervened on the behalf of America. James Madison said it's impossible for the pious man not to recognize in it a finger of the almighty hand which was so frequently extended to us in the critical stages of the revolution. Even when it came to the Constitution itself, after we're now a free nation, and, and here we are, we've, we've put the Constitution together, and even just getting that ratified and getting the nation to come together on that, even in that, Washington saw God's hand. He said, it demonstrates as visibly the finger of providence as any possible event in the course of human affairs can ever designate it. They knew that God had moved mightily in our nation, and they were smart enough to make sure they taught the next generation that. See, they said, if the next generation knows the truth, if we teach them that, then they'll follow that truth. And, and we have done, frankly, what was warned against us doing, and that is we forgot to remind every generation. We started removing God from the equation instead of injecting and making sure we kept God in the equation. Uh, this very funny looking guy right here, I know if you had hair that bad and you were that pale, you probably wouldn't sit for a portrait. But George Mason did, and so we have it. And here he is, and, and, and Mason's actually the, the father of the Bill of Rights. He's the guy that, that pushed through the, the Bill of Rights. He, he had, had refused to sign the Constitution because he didn't have the Bill of Rights. And so anyway, he had, he had also uh, done the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and that was uh, really the basis of our, our Bill of Rights. But anyway, he gave us a warning. <clears throat> he said, no free government nor the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people. Let me just stop right there. Anybody this morning want to live in freedom? Does anybody even care? Do you want to live in? Okay, we got two people, three, three people now. All right, they're coming along. All right, if you want to live in freedom, anybody want to have the blessings of liberty? You want to have the blessings of freedom? Okay, you're getting excited about it. I appreciate that. Thank you. So if you want to live in freedom, if you want to have the blessings of liberty, George Mason says the only way that's going to happen is if you have a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. The exact same thing Psalm 78 is telling us. we got to constantly remind ourselves and teach the next generation where we came from, what we've been about, and how this system works and the importance of having God in the equation. They, they, they told us this actually in the document itself, in the Declaration of Independence. I, I think of the Declaration, the, the, this part anyway, the 56 words that, that start with the second paragraph, as, as the frame of America. I think it's what really holds this thing together so that we can continue to be free. And, and, and you may have a different picture that for you would depict freedom and the blessings of liberty, but, but whatever your picture is, you put it in that frame and know this, if we lose the frame, your picture is going to go with it. If we lose the frame and the foundation, all these things that maybe you take for granted today, being able to worship this morning as we choose, being able to raise your children as you choose, being able to exercise your faith, not just have it here at church on Sunday morning, but actually go out there and live it throughout the week. Have you noticed in the last couple of decades how much that's under attack? Being able to live according to the dictates of your conscience and actually live according to your faith. A lot of people today are, are beginning to say that freedom of, of religion is just a freedom to worship. In other words, you, you hear that terminology. When people say freedom to worship instead of freedom of religion, what they're really saying is, oh, you can do that in your church on Sunday morning or at home, but don't you take it to work with you. 
Don't, don't take it out into the public square. And, and, and they're removing God from the public square. We've got to come back to the idea of freedom of religion means I get to act, I get to live, I get to work according to the dictates of my conscience and, and the faith that, that I strongly believe. So that frame is very, very important if you want to enjoy all of these things that, that you connect to freedom and liberty. And, and, and protecting that frame is our job. And I think it's interesting that Psalm 78 talks about truth and teaching truth. And then right there in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. You know, that means that the founding fathers were not moral relativists. They, they didn't believe in this idea that America's adopted lately of, oh, you do whatever feels good to you, I'll do whatever feels good to me. Uh, it's not necessarily right for you if it's right for me, and everybody do whatever's right in their own eyes. That was not the, the way that our nation was founded. Saying that we hold these truths means that there's a right and a wrong. And you think about the document itself. If they would say these are truths, and then later in the document say we're willing to pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor to these truths, they had some pretty strong conviction about those truths, right? So those truths are what made the nation great. And <coughs> excuse me, Washington thought that the most important part of those truths was the idea of religion and morality. He said of all the habits and dispositions which lead to political prosperity, and just to kind of put that in today's context, what he's saying is if you're going to have a successful nation, the cause for that effect, the, the, the formula that will produce freedom and the blessings of liberty and all those things we hold dear, he said of all the pieces of the formula that will produce that, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Not just a good idea, not just nice to have. He's saying you can't have liberty if you don't have religion and morality. And the reason he was saying this, this was actually out of his, out of his farewell address, he's actually watching the French Revolution. A and the French are trying to get what we've got. You know, they want to have the same liberty and, and things that we've enjoyed. And would you mind throwing me that water down there? Uh, and, and, and so they're trying to get what we want, but, but they're running into a bit of a problem because they didn't, thank you, man, they didn't like the God part, right? So, so our system was based on this idea of, of God gave us our freedom. So it's, you know, the rest of that, by the way, I didn't give it. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator. So the source of freedom comes from God. And then we set up government to protect that freedom. So government doesn't give us our freedom. We set up government to secure our rights. In fact, that's what the Declaration says, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among, among men. So first, God gives it to us. Then we set up government to protect it. And it worked great, and, we, and we're experiencing all this success and freedom, and, and the French are going, okay, we want the same thing. Problem is, our system said freedom from God, which means i got to live it out respecting his authority. And the French are looking over there, and they're going, yeah, we like that freedom thing. We want liberty. We want libertas, but we don't want God in this thing. We, we, we don't want any religion in this thing. So they tried to do what we did without God. So theirs was liberty without God, killed all the priests, led to absolute chaos and the guillotine. And so Washington's watching them try to get what we've got, and he's seeing them fail miserably, and he's comparing the two. And he's saying, what's the difference between the French formula and the American formula? It's God. It's we did it with God, they're doing it without. And you can just think about that logically. I mean, just practically, if you have a, a, a society that says we want freedom, and so we're going to tell everybody to have freedom, but you have no religion and morality, how long do you think you'll have liberty if you have a, a culture without any morals? I mean, how much liberty do you have if you can't even walk to your car without worrying about being raped or murdered? How much liberty do you have if you're, if you're constantly having to fight off people from stealing things from you, right? So the more that happens, government has to grow and, and, and protect us from each other, which means it's then going to start infringing upon our liberty, and we're going to have to have government, more laws and more laws and more government and more government, and so the liberty begins to shrink as government begins to grow. And so that's just a practical aspect of what he's saying. If you have religion, you're teaching morality. And if you have morality, you'll have more liberty because people will police themselves, and you'll have that buffer there of, of religion. There, there was a guy that was Speaker of the House uh, named Robert Winthrop. He said, we're either going to be ruled by the Bible or the bayonet. And what he meant was if we're ruled by the Bible, if we're actually taking what the pastor's preaching on Sunday morning and applying it to our lives throughout the week, we don't need government forcing us at the bayonet to say you're going to behave yourself. You're not going to rape, murder, and, and steal. So it really did make a huge difference in terms of the types of, of results countries got. And even right there at the beginning of our nation, Washington noticed that. And we, we tend to be forgetting that today, right? Today we want to, well, no religion, no morality. Your morality is different than my morality. And and it's leading to the same chaos that the French experienced. In fact, I have, I have a lot of friends that will say, Rick, I don't, I don't need God in this thing. You know, I, I'm a patriot. I can love freedom without 
having to have religion or, or God. And Washington actually went on to say, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism that would work to subvert these, these pillars of religion and morality. So he's saying you can't be a patriot if you don't keep God in the equation, if you don't keep that religion and morality. So having God in the equation is absolutely essential to who we are. Uh, that's that formula I was just describing, that God gives we the people these rights and freedoms, and then we set up government to protect and so secure those things. But, but we started thinking like the French about, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago, we really started saying, yeah, you know, I like freedom. I, I, I like having liberty, and I like telling government what to do, and we'll control government, not the other way around. But the problem with God being in the equation is, man, that kind of cramps my style. You know, I, that means I, there's some things I can't do, and, and I want to be able to do anything that I, I want to do. And so how about we just tweak the formula a little bit, and as a nation, we said, let's just remove the God part. You know, we'll still be in charge. I mean, we'll still have freedom and liberty. We'll still tell government what to do, and, and it'll all work out. And we didn't realize that once you start changing the formula, you get a different result. And exactly what Washington warned against is what has happened because we got God out of the equation and pushed God out of the equation. All of a sudden, government had to get bigger and bigger. And in fact, not only has government gotten bigger, we've actually twisted this thing into a system now where basically five lawyers, unelected, unaccountable lawyers in Washington, D.C., are making law for 330 million people. They're dictating to the American people what they're going to do. So no longer does the American people tell the government what it can or can't do. The government is telling us what we can or can't do. And even one branch of government now is is controlling that, and it's an unelected branch. That's what you call tyranny, folks, and we're beginning to face some of that in America, and we've got to recognize how the system was intended to work. I, I hate to tell you this. I'm a big Constitution guy, but frankly, we don't live under the Constitution in America anymore. We live under what I call the Constitution. The, the document, the words that were supposed to limit the government <clears throat> has become, frankly, irrelevant. It's now, what do the justices say? They get in their black robes. They stand around there. There are a little witch's brew there, and they throw a phrase in here and a phrase in there, and that becomes the law of America. And Madison warned about that. He said, that'll make you unstable. That, that'll make it where there's no consistency. You won't know what the law is from one day to the next. And you think about marriage. That's exactly what happened. We had the Supreme Court actually said two and a half years ago, you cannot have the federal government tell the states they have to have gay marriage. And then Justice Kennedy, a year later, same guy that said we can't do that, Woke up and I guess had something different for breakfast because then he totally changed his mind. And the Supreme Court tells us and he tells us, no, it's all about love. And yes, we're going to make the states have gay marriage and whatever, however they, whatever kind of marriage they want to have. There's no telling what's going to be next. But, but how could that change? The American people didn't vote on that. The American people didn't change their mind. Congress didn't make a law that, that, that changed any of that. Our state legislatures didn't make law. No, it was just the, really one, one guy really changed his opinion and then that ultimately changed the law of the land. That's not a constitution. That is a constitution. I uh, don't have time to go into it today, but I, I will tell you there's a way to fix this. This is not a doomsday presentation. So uh, the, the founders actually gave us some great tools in the toolbox. We just have to learn to use them. I'm a big fan of this thing called an Article 5 Convention of States. It's actually in the Constitution. It's a tool we haven't used yet, but it's a way to wipe out the Constitution and bring back the Constitution. It's literally what George Mason, the guy, funny looking guy I showed you earlier, he's the one that got up and put it in the Constitution those last couple of days of, of the convention. So I'd urge you to study that and, and, and learn how to restore it, and it will get us back to this place where God's the source, we the people control the government, not the other way around. This is actually what happened to us. Romans 1 came to life in America. It says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. And later in, in Romans 1, it says, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. And that's just from a practical point of view, that's what we did. We said, you know what? We don't want God in the equation. I don't want to have to think about God because that makes me feel guilty for my sin. I don't want to be convicted and have to change my actions. Get God out of the equation. We can do anything and everything that we want. Started in 62 with the Warren Court. Ingle v. Vitell was the case. They said no more voluntary prayer in school. We're gonna, we don't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. We're going to push God out of the equation. Next year it was Abington v. Shemp, Murray v. Collette. They said no more Bible in our schools. The Supreme Court actually said it caused brain damage. We'd be influencing the kids uh, too much. We can't do that. Now you can't pray to football game, Pledge of Allegiance, supposedly unconstitutional. We're arresting pastors for praying on the sidewalk. We're, we're threatening people with jail and fines and running them out of business if they exercise their faith in their business. Mayor of Houston a couple years ago decided to subpoena the pastor's texts and emails, private texts and emails between each other because they were working against this whole bathroom bill thing where they're uh, letting men go into women's bathrooms uh, depending on how they feel that day. And and, 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 you th and you think about all these cases and all these, all the, this world where we're saying we're going to, government's going to force you to do business with people, 
even though it's that, that action is violating your conscience. I mean, maybe you're a florist or a baker or, or a photographer, and, and the idea of taking your art and taking your gift that God's given you and actually investing it in and participating in something that God clearly says is, is wrong, I mean, for the government to force you to do that, it's, it's crazy. And, and we, what's happened is we've gotten this warped idea of, but if I don't do that, it's the same as the 60s and, 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 and not allowing black people to eat at the, at the counter with white people. And, we, and we, we, we've mixed these things together and not logically separated what is actually happening. I'll tell you what, what, uh, how I think it ought to work. This was, um, this was a flyer that I was getting printed at a, at a convention a couple of weeks ago in uh, Sandusky, Ohio. And I sent the flyer to Staples to print overnight for me, and I got an email back that said, we can't print it because it's obscene, pornographic, or dangerous material. Now, if you can, I don't know if you can tell what's on the slide there, but it's basically constitutional underpinnings of the republic, the moral foundation of, of, of a republic. We were teaching the Constitution to kids, and that was somehow obscene, pornographic, or dangerous material. Now, what I did not do was call Staples and say, I'm suing you for not printing my flyer. I actually called them and said, bravo, if you don't like my flyers, you don't have to print my flyers. If these are against what you believe and for some reason you don't want to print it, you don't have to print it. <coughs> so I said, congratulations, I found a printer in Sandusky that printed twice as many flyers for the same price. There's another verse for that, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, right? Um, so, so we got the flyers printed, and then I just did a little post on Facebook about how Staples just doesn't want to do, they actually said we're not printing these, the, this stuff for Christian patriots. And so I said, they don't want to do business with Christians, just wanted to let people know. And, and all of a sudden, uh, 50,000 people are calling uh, Staples' office of the president, and they're calling me the next day. Oh, we, we, uh, and they're back, backpedaling fast and, and apologizing and wanting to reprint our, our flyers. And I said, no, no, thanks, that's okay. They even gave me a, a uh, what do you call it, a, a, not a coupon or whatever for, for, uh, for $100 or something. And so I put on Facebook, I said, everybody, everybody nominate uh, the most offensive conservative cause you can think of and we'll let them have the the uh, the coupon to use it at staples and and uh, so offensive to the left is what I meant offensive to the to the, to the people that you know maybe a pro-life group or something like that anyway but but the, but my point is that's the free market right I mean if if they didn't want to print my flyers that's great I mean you shouldn't have to make t-shirts or fly that's the free market we should let freedom exist like that and, and certainly when it comes to your your, your closely held beliefs and, and, and your convictions and your religion. But, but today it's just not popular to say that anything is wrong. I mean, it's just, this is it. We live in a moral relativistic world where the Ten Commandments and the idea that God actually put some truths in place is offensive to people. Now, me, I think of the Ten Commandments as, wow, thank you, Lord, for the instruction manual, right? I mean, this is the manufacturer of, of the human being, and he's saying, here's the manual to show you how this thing works. I know how your brain works, how your body works, and if you'll follow these things, you're, you're going to get a lot of you know, good, good results out of the invention, the, 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 the human being. And uh, to, to say, oh, you're not going to tell me what to do. They're, you know, I'm, I'm going to live this life. That's kind of like me taking my, my, my pickup truck and, and going to get gas, and, and it's a gasoline pickup truck. And I look in the manual, it says put gasoline, not diesel in here. And I go, nobody's going to tell me how. This is my truck. I'm going to drive this truck the way I want to drive this truck. I'll put whatever I want in this truck. Nobody can throw the manual out, right? I mean, that's the manufacturer. They knew what they were doing. I'm putting diesel in this truck because I'm going to live the way I want to live. How far do you think I'm getting out of that driveway? Not very far, right? Because I, I'm foolish, right? But that's how we are. We're like, oh, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. So we say, oh, no Ten Commandments around here. No, we're not going to have any right and wrong. Everybody do whatever's right in their own eyes. And, of course, the, the result is a very different culture and society. Now it's not wrong to, uh, to, to, to hurt someone else. It, it might just depend on your particular circumstances. And, and, you know, when you teach kids, when you say to kids there's no right and wrong, do whatever feels good to you. And, oh, by the way, the student, ne student next to you there, they're just an accident. They're, they're just randomly gathered protoplasm. They're not a created being. They're not a child of God. And let's think about what happens in the mind when you start teaching those kinds of things. I, I, we're shocked that a student can walk into a classroom, take out a gun, and murder their classmates. But it happens over and over and over again. Paducah, Pearl, Jonesboro, Littleton, about every three months there's a new school shooting in America. It's buried on the back page unless it's as bad as Sandy Hook or, or, or Virginia Tech. But, you know, we love to blame the guns, right? I mean, I could put my 45 caliber C3, 6C3 up here, and we could all stand around it. We could hold hands and chant all morning long, but it's not going to jump up and shoot anybody, right? And you know why, right? Guns don't kill people. Well, that's close. It's actually Chuck Norris kills people. Is the other, is the other 
half of that equation. Chuck's a, a Texan, so I have to bring him with me every, everywhere I go. He, he actually supported me in my, my race for Supreme Court, which was, which was great, except if Chuck Norris has your phone number, when he calls, this is what it looks like on your phone. It doesn't say answer, deny. It just says answer, answer. <laughs> There's no denying Chuck, they say. So anyway, so no, no, seriously, he had it right. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. What are we really saying with that? What we're saying is that the, it's not the gun. It's not the inanimate object. It's the heart of man. It's the depravity of man. You take the guns away from us, we'll use knives, we'll use rocks, we'll go back to Cain and Abel and use a, you know, a rock or a, a, a jawbone or whatever it takes, right? We're going we're gonna to find a way. Even think about the, 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 the weapon of choice for terrorists these days is a, is a Mack truck. It's a big, they're using tr big vehicles to run over people and, and kill them. So it's the heart of man. It's not the specific weapon. That's not going to solve the problem. What you have to do is come back to the heart of man. And Jefferson said it this way, he said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we remove their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of people that these liberties are the gift of God. So he's saying, if we forget that God's the source, we're not going to live our freedom out correctly. We're not, we're not going to respect other people's liberty, and then we're going to start losing our liberty. So even Jefferson says, the firm basis of liberty is that we remember where it comes from, that we remember that God is the source, that we remember that if we're going to enjoy that freedom and if it's going to last for future generations, we've got to make sure we're living it out in a way that respects God. This is Charles Finney here. He, he put it this way with regard to we, the, the, the church, and, and this idea of politics and, and faith. He said, the church must take right ground <clears throat> in regard to politics, politics are part of a religion in a country such as this. Now, I know that, that sounds weird today, right? Because we're supposed to separate politics and, 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 and our faith. And he's saying, no, 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 actually, politics is part of your faith in a country such as this. What do you think he means by that? He's saying in a, in a, in a nation where, and, and remember how Jesus told us, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's? Well, guess who Caesar is in America? You are. Not the president, not Congress. We the people, you're the beginning of freedom in America. So if you're Caesar, if ultimately you're in charge, then he's saying politics is part of your faith. It means that if you're in charge, then everything we do, we're supposed to do in a way that honors God, right? And we're supposed to do biblically because the Bible applies to everything. So if we're going to live out our faith in our entire life, then if we accept our responsibility and duty as a citizen, then our faith should influence our politics as well. So Christians must do their duty to their country as a part of their duty to God. God will bless or curse his nation according to the course Christians take in politics. I, I, I believe that firmly. I think our nation depends on the church continuing to be salt and light. If we're not salt and light, the nation is doomed. But if the church is salt and light, if we've still got that flavor, if we're still influencing and we're molding and we're, and we're, and we're influencing the nation uh, to do what is right, then I, I believe we can return to this place where, where we enjoy liberty and we enjoy our, our religious freedoms and all the things that, that you hold dear. So I, I want to ask you just to consider this. In a couple of weeks when we celebrate Independence Day and you think about the signers of the Declaration pledging their lives, fortunes, and, and sacred honor. What would you do if you had been in that room? Or, or, or if we were to recreate that room right here and, and put a copy of the Declaration of Independence up here and, and say, all right, everybody, we've got a duty and responsibility to preserve freedom. What are you willing to do to preserve it? And whatever your age, if you're 8 or 80, and until you're 6 feet under, you've got a duty and a responsibility to do your part, right? So if I was to say to you, we're going we're gonna to call everybody forward one by one, and you're going to put your name alongside the names of those men that signed the Declaration of Independence, would you be willing to pledge your life, your fortune, and your sacred honor? If you are, if you think freedom's, and, and I used to say, what's your freedom worth to you? I've learned the better question is, what's your child's freedom worth to you? See, it causes us to think differently. We go, okay, what am I willing to do to make sure my kid gets to enjoy the liberties that I've enjoyed? If, if you are willing to do that, I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. Number one, give of your life, meaning your time. Meaning every week, take a couple of hours or one hour and say, I'm going to invest in freedom. I'm going to you know, make phone calls or I'm going, to, I'm going to study the Constitution. Or I'm going to do something that helps preserve the nation. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to read my Bible and see how that applies to the culture today. <clears throat> take that Constitution class that David and I did. We actually teach you in Independence Hall in the room where the Constitution was framed. We go pull a lot of cool stuff off the shelves at the, at the library there and original documents and whatnot. But do a Sunday school class here or get people over to your house and actually walk through that, that Constitution so you know your freedoms. Study the candidates when the election's coming up. Make sure you're voting. Don't be like some of my friends. I'm not voting, Rick. I will not vote for the lesser of two evils. All right, well, unless Jesus Christ is on the ballot, 
you're going to vote for the lesser of two evils. <laughs> there, there is none righteous, no, not one, right? We are all flawed jars of clay. And in every situation, we just had to pray for discernment to say, Lord, which one's best? <laughs> which, one can, which one's going to be the least evil of all of these? Which one's going to be the most biblical or in, in, be the most likely to uh, surround themselves with biblical people and actually put good policies in place? So study those candidates and then just make an informed decision about that and help spread the word to others. Don't don't rely on the document, the Constitution, and think that that's enough. The document is not enough. We're, we're literally not even being governed by it right now. John Francis Mercer here helped frame it. He's one of the 55 to frame it. He said it's a great mistake to suppose the paper we are to propose will govern the United States. He's actually saying the Constitution is not going to govern the United States. He said it's the men whom it will bring into the government and the interest they have in maintaining it that will govern them. The paper will only mark out the mode and the form, men are the substance and must do the business. In other words, he's saying if you put people in office and on the bench that are willing to govern around it, to shred it, to, to, to ignore it, then it doesn't mean anything. So who we put in office is essential to making sure we bring that document back. So your life is your time. Spread the word. Share good news with your friends and family. Help them understand how to apply the Bible to our culture and to our daily lives. We have a radio program called Wall Builders Live. You can listen to that Monday through Friday. And there's a quick 30-minute program that will encourage you. We're very Joshua and Caleb-like. We're not... Like the 10 spies that came back, it's too hard, the giants are too big, for we can't do it, depressed everybody. That's not us. We're like Joshua and Caleb. We're like, hey, we might be 85, but, man, we're taking that city right there. We're taking the, the most fortified, the hardest one to get. We're going after it. So we're very encouraging, and we'll give you tips and tools on, on how to make a difference. <clears throat> Last thing in terms of your time is to invest in the next generation. Look for some young people that you can pour into, that you can pass the torch to. We have a, a program called Patriot Academy where we train young people from around the nation in state capitals across the nation in biblical application uh, in, 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 in our culture, how to, how to take the Bible and have good, good worldview and implement it. In other words, how to win also. So how to be the men of Issachar, understanding the times and knowing what to do. Not just pounding the bully pulpit, but actually being effective and winning the day. So that we take over those capitals and they come in and they live the life of a, of a legislator. Uh, it's amazing what God's doing with these young people in the next generation. Show you a quick 50 second clip here and then I'll close. Without question, the busiest part of our year is the week of Patriot Academy. Welcome Patriot Academy! <laughs> The purpose of Patriot Academy is to awaken a generation. We teach them how to make a difference in the world around them. They get to do everything that a real legislator would do. Hey, are y'all for or against term limits? He is flipping votes against a bill that I'm fighting for. I was just counting up votes, and it does not look good. Ronald Reagan once said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Those veterans literally passing that torch was incredibly powerful. The banquet is a theme that I look forward to all year. We want to make it a night that they won't forget. Generations before us paid the price, whatever price necessary, to defend the fire of liberty. Now it's our turn. Oh, that ceremony at the end of Patriot Academy always gets me when the, we had these veterans come up and say, I was willing to die for your freedom. Now it's time for you to go live it. And these young people, just uh, it just spikes the moment. I'm telling you, it takes everything we've been teaching them all week and, and ingrains it so that they'll go out and be active. So that's your life. Give of your time to those different things, your fortune. Man, start giving more to your church so that your church can be the epicenter of the community. The reason government's gotten so big is because as the church, we, we've taken less and less responsibility in the culture. So let's make sure we're, we're empowering our local church to be able to do that. Invest in good organizations and causes. Sponsor some kids to go to Patriot Academy. There's legal organizations out there defending your freedom. And then lastly, your sacred honor. So lies, fortunes, sacred honor. That means you've got to be willing to stand up and speak truth in a culture that doesn't want to hear it right now. Be willing to say, this is the truth, and then whatever they call you, that's okay. We're willing to take the names and the shots and the, all that good stuff, but we're going to speak truth regardless of what it costs. That's how we can once again be salt and light. That's how we can be that city on a hill. So just a couple of tidbits for you. I hope in the next couple of weeks you think about where we came from as a nation. We're sort of like we were in uh, eight, April 19th, uh, 1775. That's Lexington right there. We had the chance to go watch them. We do a TV show called Chasing American Legends that Kurt was talking about, and it's a fun way to learn. History does not have to be boring. It can be exciting, and we take comedian Brad Stein with us, and we go investigate all these mysteries and history's mysteries kind of stuff, but, but we went to Lexington to figure out who fired first, who shot first, <clears throat> and uh, had a great time doing that, but when we're standing there that morning, and, and it's just barely get, getting to be daylight, and, and I hear the British coming over the hill, and we're watching this reenactment, and that little group of, of, of Minutemen are lined up there, just a ragtag bunch, and 
and it's supposed to be about 800 British coming over the hill, and, and you can hear the drums and the, and the marching, and, and here they come, and I'm thinking, man, this is 10 to 1 odds, and these guys were still willing to stand in defense of freedom, and, and when the British got in position, Major uh, Pitt Carey, he said to the Americans, he said, disperse ye rebels, disperse ye villains, lay down your arms. Captain Parker, he walked up and down, and we got to sit there, and we have it on the video. It's really cool. He actually walks up there, and he yells out. He says, don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have war, let it begin here. Then that shot is fired, and that's where our freedom literally began. That shot heard around the world happened right there, and, and man, it took a generation that understood the importance of teaching truth to the next generation, of reminding them of what God had done. For us to overwhelm, I mean, against overwhelming odds, God's power was shown in the Revolutionary War. I believe his power is shown every day in America, even now. You don't hear the stories, but he's doing it. And if we will, will, will be willing to say, God, here I am. Send me. I'm willing to go, whatever it is. It may not be going and dying on a battlefield. It's just literally standing in the gap today and being willing to speak truth to a culture that doesn't really want to hear it. If you'll do that, I believe we'll take that torch that was given to us. We'll teach those truths to the next generation, and we'll pass it intact to the next generation. God bless you guys.